Hi, everyone. Michael Britt here. Now, I'm very proud that the Psych Files podcast has been so successful. It passed the 20 million download mark. And a lot of that success is due to my episodes on how you can use proven memory strategies to remember just about anything, from memorizing terms for a test to remembering people's names at a party or a meeting. So I put all of these episodes into one audio course. Hippos, aliens, and llamas quickly master the tricks to a great memory. And it's available now on avid.fm slash memorymaster. All one word. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 320 of The Psych Files. And we've got a really interesting episode for you today. You have no doubt heard a lot about what's sweeping the country, and that is the legalization of cannabis. And a lot of people are using it to help them with their psychological distress. So I have an interview for you today with Dr. Nancy Haug, and she has done some very interesting research, especially on the people who work at cannabis dispensaries. What do they know? Can you take advice from them? Should you? And so she's got some really interesting research to tell us about. And we'll be updating you on what's the latest regarding cannabis and mental health. Okay, lots and lots of talk about the legalization of cannabis. It's happening in many states in the, in the United States. And within a short period of time, I think it's going to be legal all over the country. There are a number of places to get the latest research. And so I'll be talking to Nancy Haug. And she's a researcher who will tell us about that. So let's go to the interview with Professor Nancy Haug. We are talking with Professor Nancy Haug. And she has published a fascinating article on the training and practices of cannabis dispensary staff. She has done some interesting research, her and a bunch of colleagues, about what people who work at dispensaries, cannabis dispensaries, what do they do, what do they know, what sort of training have they had. And so I thought uh, our audience would find her study very interesting. So welcome, Nancy. Thank you, Michael, for having me. I'm delighted to be here. Great. Yeah, I'll bet this is such a, a hot topic right now. I'm, I'm in New York, and we expect that they will be um, legalizing recreational marijuana within a couple of months. Uh, you know, the, ter- the medical marijuana thing has been around for a long time, but this is the headline news. Why don't you tell us a little bit about sure. your background? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Okay. So my background is in addiction treatment research. I started off in Baltimore, actually, doing my graduate work, and I had a position as a research assistant at a Johns Hopkins uh, Center for Addiction and Pregnancy. So I worked with pregnant women who were um, misusing heroin, cocaine, cannabis, alcohol. Um, my dissertation was around a smoking cessation study for pregnant women. And so I really, at that point, started down the road of doing addiction treatment work and came out to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area in 2001 for my internship and postdoc at UCSF, where I continued doing this um, research, mostly with folks who were using opioids. And I started to get into medication adherence for substance users who also had HIV AIDS. Around that time, especially in the San Francisco Bay Area, I had a lot of patients who were talking about using cannabis for pain relief. Um, some of them had, you know, serious addictions with it. Um, but I started to get sort of interested. I also was coming at things from a more harm reduction perspective, which has been a thread in my work as well, especially, you know, I was at a methadone clinic and doing a lot of kind of public health interventions for substance users. And I really didn't know much about um, cannabis dispensaries. It really wasn't, you know, something I'd ever experienced in Baltimore. It it just wasn't really an option. But in California, it had become, there were medical cannabis dispensaries starting in, I think it was 1996. And so there weren't a lot of regulations around Mm. this time, but they were, you know, sort of popping up. And I heard people talking about them. And I we just became really curious about like, well, what, what happens in the dispensaries? Like, do you go in and, and buy weed? Like who's going to these dispensaries? Like what, it was just this whole new phenomenon. And so I had a friend of a friend who I found out worked in a dispensary 
And so I got in contact with him and told him I was interested and asked if I could just come in and observe like what goes on in the dispensary. And so it took a little bit of finagling um, because they were at that time really scared about being shut down by the federal government. Mm -hmm. And it was all like very hush hush, like nobody really knew where the dispensaries were, how to get access to them. And so he allowed me to come in one day. So this was a, a dispensary on Haight Street in San Francisco. Oh. You walk in and you wouldn't even know um, that this was a dispensary because there was a storefront that was like this head shop where they sold like tie-dye T-shirts and um, pipes and paraphernalia. I went to the back of the the store and of pushed a button. Was in the back, right? <laughs> right. It was way in the back behind the curtain. <laughs> no, exactly. No, literally it was. And you it push was? a button and somebody, you know, comes to the door and they oh, check dear. you out and they ask you for your ID. And I went in the back and um, just sort of, sort of sat in a corner and, and watched what happened. And it, it was a very different environment. I don't know if you've been in a no, dispensary recently, but, yeah. you know, the dispensaries now are, are very professional and, you know, it's set up more like a pharmacy. But this right. just had a counter. You know, none of the products were labeled. They're just like with like cookies and brownies <laughs> and like, you know, jars of weed. Um, yeah, you know, you remind me. So when I saw the article in our, in our town newspaper, which still exists, you know, it was right on that first page, and it was, I don't know, this place is maybe a half an hour away, and there were a couple of pictures, and, you know, it's curiosity, it's, I mean, if something was previously illegal, and now it's not, you're like, hey, what does that look like in there? Mm-hmm. <laughs> is it in jars mm-hmm. or bags? Are it bins? <laughs> exactly, exactly, and I think the, the thing that really stuck with me, and that was a catalyst for, for my work in this area was that the patients who came in, you know, to purchase medical cannabis were not who I expected them to be. I I thought, you know, and I was coming at this, you know, from some judgment and bias, perhaps, that it was going to be young hippie kids Mm. with backpacks and, you know, they were just coming in to score some weed. And it was not like that. These were people who were very sick, chronic illness, wheelchairs, you know, physically disabled, and, and they were coming in to, to purchase cannabis as a medication. Like they, they really which... needed it for all sorts of different conditions. Um, you know, I'd say mostly chronic pain. And what does you know, pain uh, uh, derive from? Um, cancer pain, oh. HIV, AIDS, you know, different sorts of medical conditions. Um, you know, I didn't really have a lot of interaction with the patients. I was more there just to observe. It wasn't like a formalized research study. This was in the early 2000s. You know, I didn't have any kind of IRB approval to do. It It was really just more I was going in to try to understand like what's going on here to, to kind of inform, you know, my understanding of medical cannabis and dispensaries. And so, you know, that experience really opened my eyes to the idea that people are using cannabis as a medication, because previously I had really thought of it more as a recreational drug and a drug of, you know, abuse and and addiction. And I hadn't considered this other perspective that maybe people could really benefit from it. Yeah. The earliest memory I have of it being used for medical purposes wasn't it for like glaucoma mm-hmm. that okay. was one of the yeah. indications i think the the science has sort of disproved that one oh really that oh. that indication at least the most recent from what i've read so now you hear it being used for all kinds of things and you right. can list them right. here in your in your article i hear a lot about um anxiety ptsd and yet you hear in the same breath that well, there hasn't been any research on <laughs> right, right, right. So yeah. the state of the research is what then? Well, <laughs> so the National Academy of Sciences published. It's called the Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids: The Current State of Evidence and Recommendations for Research, and I believe that came out in 2016. And who was but that publisher? It was a panel of experts, of scientific experts, um, but it was published by the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. All right. I'll I'll try to link to that from my website. Yeah, I can send it to you. Okay. Oh, that'd be great. If you would, that'd be great. Yeah. And so they go through all of the current research to date and provide 
a summary of, you know, what do we have conclusive evidence for in terms of therapeutic effects of cannabis? Where is there substantial evidence, moderate evidence, limited evidence? And they go through all of the different medical conditions a little bit with the mental health as well. Mm. And so really, we don't have a whole lot of evidence for the effectiveness of cannabis for any mental health condition. It's really the most substantial evidence that we have is for chronic pain in adults. And it's also been used a lot as a treatment for um, nausea and vomiting that's associated with chemotherapy induced and also um, with HIV AIDS. And then multiple sclerosis spasticity symptoms that that's what we have the most evidence for. And, so, and chronic pain is such a broad category. Yeah, right. I think the research what has been done in more specific populations of cancer, cancer patients. So, yes. you know, you can easily imagine a study. I mean, I, I don't know what medication they give cancer patients to alleviate or deal with pain. But, you know, uh, you can imagine a study where this group got this medication, this group got the cannabis mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the measures to follow. Um, right. So, so this paper that you just referred to was 2016. We're in 2019. Are they right. going to be right. updating it every few years? Do you know? I, I assume so. Yeah. I mean, I think um, more and more is coming out all the time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's it's actually hard to keep up with. There's there's so many papers with different you know different results depending on the population that they're studying. You know, we have medical cannabis, we have recreational cannabis now. A lot of people, I would say, are using for both purposes. Less and less it, is it being used now for exclusively medical reasons, especially, I think, with the legalization by many states where you no longer have to have a medical card to go into a dispensary. In a lot of places, you know, like in California, for example, um, people can go to a dispensary and they don't have to say that they have a medical condition. They can just go in and buy cannabis for any reason. Mm -hmm. All right. And that's what it looks like we'll be having here in, in New York. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, Cuomo? Is that yes, your... right. That was uh -huh. one of the things he talked about mm -hmm. in his reelection. And right. Enough. Right. I did read about that. OK, so we we don't know. We don't have any really good solid science regarding cannabis and mental health. Um, but the studies are coming out. So in that atmosphere, I guess it is curious. So the people in this, I assume, sparked your story in the beginning, sparked you to ask the question to yourself. So in other words, on what do these these people who work at the dispensaries, uh, what do they base, what are they doing? Right. What are they saying to people? Exactly. Yeah. So I was collaborating with Marcel Bon Miller, who was at the Palo Alto VA at the time, and he had launched a couple of studies looking at dispensary patients in San Francisco and the San Jose, I believe, in the Bay Area. And he had established some relationships with dispensaries and they were looking at these patients and veterans in particular. What are they using cannabis for? He was really interested in PTSD and anxiety. And so, um, you know, I kind of joined forces with him and and started to become interested in dispensary staff workers. They are the people who the patients are interfacing with when they go into the dispensaries. So yeah, it used now, to be since you don't right. you're not going to go to your doctor. I don't have exactly. to go to your doctor. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. They used to have to go and get a physician recommendation kind of like a prescription, but not, not really that formalized, um, in order to go to the dispensaries. But they would only meet with that person once to get this recommendation. There would be no follow-up care. The physician might say, you know, try this or try that. But really, when they go into the dispensaries, it's the frontline mm -hmm. workers who are giving the advice and, you know, talking to them about the products. And they're often called bud tenders. Oh, is that the name? A bud tender? Is it some Bud tender. Oh, like, oh, instead of bartender. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. so the bud tenders you know, are selling the products and they're making recommendations. And so I became really interested in who are these bud tenders? What is their background? What is their training? What are they basing their recommendations on? And so that's how we came up with the, the survey, dispensary staff workers. 
we really just generated the questions based on our own knowledge and, and interest in this topic and some of the things the patients had told us. And you know, we consulted with a couple experts and we, we devised a um, pretty simple survey and sent it out to our contacts. Let me throw in a question if I may. So what's a typical question? Is it Likert scales? Um, yes. So yes. How often, uh, uh, yes or no in terms of whether you've had training and then what, seven or nine point Likert scales? Yeah, we asked them a lot about what type of training, you know, kind of what is your background? Um, what do you base your recommendations on? You know, is it based on your previous experience? Is it based on what your patients have told you? Do you read journal articles? You know, have you had any scientific or medical training or background? Questions like that. You use the word patients just now, but the, these are also customers, right? Customers, mm-hmm. patients, consumers. I mean, I think there's a lot of different language that's used. We also asked them questions about the conditions that the patients were coming in for, you know, kind of what they were seeing. And then based on the conditions, for example, anxiety or depression or PTSD or other, you know, chronic pain, what would the recommendations they're making with in terms of CBD versus THC and sativa versus indica. And we kind of went through that for all of the different conditions that we asked about. So that made it a little bit longer. It's kind of like a matrix um, <laughs> with all these different items they could select. Now, and, and can you just, just to be sure, I mean, I've done some reading, some uh, others may not. You mentioned uh, CBD and, and THC and uh, sativa. Just give us right, a quick right. background, if you would. In sure, sure. So one thing I wanted to mention is I prefer to use the word cannabis versus marijuana. And that's because if you look at the history of the word marijuana, it actually has some racist undertones. And it's, it's sort of a pejorative term that was used a lot in the 1930s um, for prohibition purposes mm-hmm. by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. A lot of people really feel like it contributes to the negative stigma around oh, cannabis. Mm-hmm. So cannabis is the plant name. Mm-hmm. Um, sativa and indica are really um, types of the genus cannabis, so that they're just strains. And I, th- I, I like to think of it. So my husband is a, an organic farmer and we grow a lot of heirloom tomatoes. And so I, I think of it like as, you know, the different types of tomatoes, like you might have a brandy wine and, and the plant, you know, has potato leaves and it looks a certain way and it has a certain flavor. And then you might have a different type of tomato, like say a Cherokee purple that grows a different way and looks a little bit different, has a different taste. It, it's really just different types of the same plant. Mm -hmm. And it just depends on your preference for what it looks like and smells like and tastes like. So I don't see it much different than that. So there's a lot of choices in these dispensaries then. Exactly. And I think what the research has shown is that the actual cannabis from the sativa versus indica plants really isn't that much different. It's more of a growing distinction than it is meaningful for the actual user. So it's like your Uh, tomato example. They still (laughs) both taste like tomatoes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. But they might have slightly different properties. And the reality is most cannabis now is a hybrid. It's, It's There's not probably, you know, true sativa or true indica um, the way it once was. You know, sativa traditionally came from warmer climates. Um, It's been associated with, you know, more of an energizing quality, um, more of what people call like a head, a head high, heady high. And then indica developed more in a colder climate, um, it's kind of more of a bushy plant, kind of short, has a, a, you know, a shorter flowering cycle. And it's associated more with a bodily high and it's thought to be more relaxing and people use it a lot for sleep. And these distinctions probably at this point don't really exist. It, it's more of how the, the plant is grown and the level of THC versus CBD that's more meaningful than okay. the actual sativa versus indica. All right. So and so, tell us about those two then? Sure. Yeah. So... THC is a cannabinoid. 
So I don't know how much you want me to get into the endocannabinoid system, but that's our um, biological endogenous system where the cannabis is taking effect. And THC is a psychoactive compound that's found in the cannabis plant. It's the one we know the most about because that's it's responsible for the psychoactive effects uh, of cannabis. You know, get people getting a high or having um, pain relief. It's mostly associated with THC. And CBD is another compound. So the cannabis plant actually has, at least what we know, at least 120 different chemical compounds or cannabinoids. Wow. And CBD is another one of these cannabinoids. And they're thought to work synergistically. So it's not just THC that's having an effect. It's these other cannabinoids that we're just starting to study and understand there's a term that's been coined called the entourage effect, where the cannabinoids are thought to work together synergistically. And so the, the CBD actually offsets some of the negative effects of THC. So CBD is thought to be, I think we talked about this in the paper, more anxiolytic, meaning it relieves anxiety, versus anxiogenic, which is um, sometimes what the effect that THC can have. So it can actually induce anxiety and paranoia and sort of these kind of negative, at the extreme end, almost psychotic effects. And now, so CBD, the, hasn't CBD been available for a while because you don't get high on just CBD, right. It does know. not have a psychoactive effect. Right. And it's kind of been adopted by the wellness community as sort of this panacea for everything. You see CBD drinks and oils and lotions and all sorts of products. Yeah, that's part of the problem, and, right? It's, it's a, it's a cure all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, a little bit. There has been some research on it, and it, it, it has been found to be effective for certain conditions, including pain when combined with THC. And also it's been used for treating epilepsy hmm. in children. And, and people do claim that it has this effect on anxiety. And we've seen that a little bit in the research. I think it hasn't shown up as much as some of the claims. I think we see it more in not so much normal controls, but people who have anxiety disorders actually report that CBD can be helpful for them. Hmm. So I think that you know, the jury's still out on CBD, what exactly it's doing, but we know that it can be helpful for some people. Okay. All right. So tell us then uh, about this. You sent out the survey. Uh, right. How did you do that? Person over the web? Yeah. So both. I really felt like when I started to get into this research again, that I needed to kind of update my knowledge and skills. Things had changed so much since I was in college and I, I didn't even know some of the lingo and the products. So I actually went and got a medical card. My state didn't have of recreational mm -hmm. cannabis, it was still medical and it was, it was pretty tightly controlled like in the earlier days. So I got the card and I just started visiting dispensaries just to kind of check them out and talk to people, learn about cannabis and the different products. I didn't know anything about vaping and the oils and all the different ways people, you know, in my day it was like you know, my, I think my college roommate had a bong and people yeah, smoked bong, joints and, and that was, kind, yeah, that was kind of it, right? <laughs> yes. There wasn't like a whole lot of variety or different strains or, you know, different mm. products. So yeah, I just became really familiar with what was going on in the dispensaries and talking to staff members and kind of figuring out what would be appropriate questions to ask them if we're you know it's really trying to scientifically study like what's happening in these dispensaries. So you, if I imagining, I would be a little <laughs> nervous if I was working there, and you walked up with a little clipboard. Now, nah, right, if I ask you a few questions, uh, no, well, no. Th at this point, I was really doing more sort of almost like ethnographic research, where I I was pretending to be a patient. So I would go in, I'd ask them questions just for my own knowledge as a patient, and then what we did was 
we used dispensary finders on the internet. Like oh, there's one called Weed Maps, another other one called Leafly, where we just looked for dispensaries and sort of I had my students either email or just cold call them and ask for people who were interested in being sent a link to a survey. Mm-hmm. And then also we had through my other colleagues that I mentioned before, we had a list that had been compiled by a nonprofit called Americans for Safe Access, where they had found, at least at that time, all of the dispensaries in the country and had their contact information. So that was super helpful because we could send out emails to all of them. I expected to have a much higher response rate than Mm. we actually got because we had, we contacted a lot of dispensaries, but a lot of them, the email either didn't work or we got some sort of automated response. So there really wasn't anyone on the other end. Um, when I'm looking at your article, it looks like you sent out 550? Mm-hmm. 55 yeah. completed right. surveys. Yeah. Have you thought about doing it again next year? Yes, I have. And uh-huh. we actually are about to submit for publication a second study that was kind of an outgrowth of this survey where it's a qualitative examination. So we got interviews from 11 dispensary staff members where we really drilled down into training that they're receiving and some of the obstacles to training. Just ask them a lot of different questions about their role in the dispensary, Hmm. which we found was really interesting that a lot of the dispensary staff we talked to weren't even really sure like what they were supposed to be doing. Like, are they customer service? Mm -hmm. Are they like a product specialist? Are they supposed to be giving medical advice? Like what, what is their role? They didn't want to overstep and give recommendations that they shouldn't be. But at the same time, the customers are asking them, well, what's the best formula for sleep? Yeah. So so this is different than like, if you worked in a organic health food store um, and people ask you, hey, what, you know, what's mm-hmm. the best, uh, what's the difference between this kind of cereal and that, you know, wheat and germ? I mean, you know, those are okay questions, but here you're, you've got people come to you, let's say they have anxiety or PTSD. I mean, now this is a right. much more serious kind right. of question to be asked. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and some of them felt like they didn't have the training mm-hmm. or the background to be able to answer those questions. And so, and it seems like dispensaries, depending on the state that they're in and dispen- depending on the regulations, have different approaches for training the dispensary staff. Some of them have in-house trainings and then others will say, we'll do this online training that's already been established and that's enough for us and whatever you want to do on your own. So a lot of times it's left up to the dispensary staff member to educate themselves. Wow. All right. So what other sorts of things did did you find then from the survey? What I'm looking at here in the study is that you've got, well, I think at one point you say, of the very small number that have had, that had any kind of training at all, I think it was actually about half, right? Mm-hmm. Who said they so half of these dispensary staff had no formal training, right, right, right. Wow. Yeah. And I think that is changing now. We are going to do another survey to see what's happening, but it, it, at least from the dispensary staff we've been talking to and doing these interviews with, it sounds like they're being required to obtain some sort of training, whether it's online or in person, um, so that they're a little bit better informed. And I think some of that is just from a business perspective. They want the frontline workers to know about the products. And yeah, so I mean, you would think that customers in any store, I mean, they can right. tell whether you know anything right. about it or not. Right. And if you don't, right. especially if competition comes like right now, I would, I would guess this. I mean, we, I know this is the only dispensary in the area. So that once there are more of them, they're probably going to be more training of the staff. Right. I think the other thing that surprised me was that a lot of the dispensary staff workers, and this was in our study and another study, are women. I guess it's not that surprising, but I, I guess I had always thought about cannabis as being more, I don't know, of a male activity. Mm-hmm, yeah, I know. Oddly enough, yeah. I don't know why. Is that um, but women it's... taking the usual role of caretaker? Well, I, I mean, I wonder about that a little bit. You know, why, why are they attracted to those positions? And mm-hmm. yeah, I think there needs to be more study around that. You know, who are these people? And what is their interest in working with cannabis and working with 
with patients. Yeah, that's a good um, question to ask. In that role, right. Yeah. Why would they do that? Yeah, I mean, one of the pieces of data that kind of came out at me from the study, that 89% base their advice on the condition or the ailment that the mm-hmm. person says that they're... But you've got like uh, 79% just talk about the experience other people have. Well, I know people right. who, you know, well, right. okay. Right. You know, um, their own experience was 71%, sort of like, well, I prefer this one over that one. Right, <laughs> oh, right. boy, yeah. Um, and, I've, and I've heard dispensary staff, you know, when I've gone in and I've heard them talking to people, um, I've heard them say, oh, I really like this one, you should try it. And it's not even based on anything except their own preferences or experiences. And is that someone responding to a question like, um, you know, I've been very anxious lately? Yes, yeah, I, or I, sleep is one that comes up a lot. Mm. Yeah, so. You know, the scariest number, I think, uh, is is the 21%. I mean, in this study, that's nine people. So we'll, it'll be interesting right. to see what you get next right. year. But still, who main motivation is what, whatever needs to be moved out of yeah. inventory. <laughs> right. We, we got right. an overstock of this, so uh, right. let's push right. this one this week. Uh, problematic. Yeah. yeah. Well, and but, you know, it's now it, – this is an industry, right? It's mm. been completely – corporatized it's big business in a lot of places especially the recreational dispensaries they just want to move product and so you know we're going to put stuff on sale we're going to give incentives for certain products and that's for the dispensary owners it's just we want to we want to sell more cannabis like they probably aren't considering the needs of patients did you ever see a sign that said something like you're responsible what happens to you or, you know, we, we are not qualified um, physician. You, you mm. should, it's sort of like going on a diet, right? Well, of course, you should talk to your doctor. Right, right. right. I haven't seen signs like that. So what does the average person uh, do at this point? I mean, so if you, right. um, you know, have PTSD, you know, let's say anxiety, I mean... Do you, if we, are there? I mean, there's journal research, which never seems to get to the public. Right. I think one good site, have you heard of Arrowid? I don't even know how to spell. Okay. E-R-O-W-I-D. It's a harm reduction website that I believe was originally developed to inform people about psychedelics and different kind of designer drugs or they're sometimes called research chemicals, where there's just not a lot of information. And it, I think it originated as a lot of personal stories and anecdotes, but it's now become, I think, somewhat of an authority on a lot of the um, scientific research that's out there. I mean, it still has a lot of you know, personal stories and information, uh, but I think it's a very helpful site. Yeah, I'm looking at it now, and uh, so that's, you know, E-R-O-W-I-D dot org. I'll have a link to that from my website. But, yeah, I'm mm-hmm. seeing they have, for example, a monthly newsletter. Right, right. Mm-hmm. So they will probably so I, tell you about newly published research? Yes, they do have a lot of scientific information and articles up there that I think could be really helpful for the lay public. Mm-hmm. Any other uh, source? Um, Leafly is, I think, pretty decent. L-E-A-F-L-Y. It's more of like a sort of dispensary finding kind of site, but I think they have pretty good articles where they incorporate, they try to incorporate current research. And I found it to be surprisingly accurate for a lot of things. I mean, I think it's definitely slanted more towards cannabis is this wonderful drug that's really helpful to a lot of people. You know, I think it's important to have a balanced perspective that this is also can be a dangerous drug and very addictive for a lot of people. When you find websites or information, it tends to lean one way or the other, where it's like, be really careful, this is addictive, you shouldn't use it, or like, this is the greatest thing ever, and you can use it for everything. So I think we have to be really careful and, and sort of see both sides um, yeah, the the bigger the claims, <laughs> or more right. outlandish they are, and especially if if I see one of these sites sells the cannabis, so I'd, I'd be like, mm, you know, if right. you stand to make a big profit, then I don't right. know how independent your recommendations right. are. Right, 
Yeah. And I'm sure Leafly probably gets a lot of kickbacks from dispensaries and, Mm -hmm. you know, different cannabis industries. But I think they try to provide information and evidence, you know, especially with CBD and THC and some of the the different products and the effects. Okay, yeah. The Arrowhead site looks pretty good. Yes, yes, I would recommend Arrowhead. So, uh, I mean, I would also yeah. refer people to those the scientific um, research I mentioned earlier from the National Academy of Sciences. If they're really interested in looking at a summary of the current scientific evidence to date for different medical conditions. Yeah, we have a number of listeners who are you know, mental health professionals. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the national so as again, I'll have a link to that National Academy of Sciences. Okay. I mean, I, I have a, a small private practice, and I have I see patients with addiction problems, some of whom are using cannabis, and you know, I wouldn't recommend cannabis as a first line treatment for any mental health condition. I would definitely tell them to try the traditional routes first with their psychiatrist and with their doctors. And then if those fail and those really don't work, then maybe we could consider cannabis at a low dose, especially cannabis with CBD, because it's now believed that CBD has some neuroprotective effects against THC and that it can be you know, helpful for some people. So that would probably be my recommendation. But again, it, you know, it's on a case by case basis right. and mm-hmm. I want to work with, a, you know, their other providers. And I wouldn't just recommend, well, maybe you should try cannabis for mm-hmm. your depression or anxiety. Like that would not be something I would start with for sure. Right. right. We always want to be careful because of serious pa- conditions. Yeah. And especially for people with a history of addiction, because mm-hmm. I've also had patients who are coming in with a history of using, you know, cocaine or opioids or even alcohol, and they're now substituting cannabis and they're saying, well, but I can function and I'm doing a lot better. And I think that does work for some people. But again, I think we have to be really careful because there's still, you know, an addictive process happening there Mm -hmm. and, you know, can have negative consequences. All right. Well, listen, thank you so much for being on the show and educating our listeners. It's been really interesting. So uh, I'll have a link to your site. Uh, You've got other research in the hopper now around. Yes, we're about to um, launch a study on vaping, which is another new phenomenon. I'm particularly interested in adolescents and uh, women, why they're vaping? Are they using it as a harm reduction method, it, you know, instead of smoking, or is it something that's more like convenient and discreet? So, we'll we'll mm-hmm. keep you posted on that work as well. Yeah, it's funny about vaping. I mean, at first I thought, well, okay, um, I guess it's just another thing. It's harmless. Uh, <laughs> the kids are doing it. and Yeah. Um, but now, you're, I don't know, you are starting to hear about vaping not being harmless. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think we're starting to see that kids are using it a lot more frequently because it's so easy and it's so convenient and it doesn't have the same smell. So it's not as easily detected by parents and teachers. And that because it's so accessible and available, they're using it more and they're becoming addicted at an even faster rate. So that's problematic and yeah. it definitely needs to be studied. Mm-hmm. Well, these are different times than when I. Yes, can. definitely. <laughs> All right, Nancy, again, thank you for your research. You you said you were at... Currently, I'm at Palo Alto University, and I have an affiliation at Stanford in the Department of Psychiatry. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. No problem. Take care now. If you want to get more information about the research that's been done on cannabis that uh, Professor Haug mentioned, then come to the site, and you'll see the links to those resources. Hope this was an episode that really... Gave you a lot lot to think about. Certainly did for me when I was uh, talking with Professor Haug. There's a lot we need to learn about the effects of cannabis. So uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about it in the future. And I thank you for listening. And I will see you in the next episode of The Psych Files. Take care.